let's welcome back um, everyone to the afternoon sessions. And we are starting this afternoon with answering the question, do we need a new framework for human rights in the metaverse? So I'm pretty sure we all can agree that there is a need for the international community to identify and critique the existing human rights frameworks to potentially enable a secure and interoperable metaverse. So the United Nations and global governments have an important role to play in these technological developments. Most, most importantly, the virtual worlds that are infused with artificial intelligence and neural technologies and studying their impact that will mitigate threats to human rights. So please welcome to the stage, Sarah Rattray, Senior Advisor on the Human Rights for the United Nations Development Program. Sarah provides policy and program leadership and support on human rights for sustainable development. This includes a human rights-based approach to digital transformation and how to manage human rights risks. Sarah has worked for over 20 years for the United Nations systems, including areas in Bosnia, Afghanistan, Kosovo, and in the headquarters of human rights policy and mainstreaming. She has also worked as a legal expert for the European Commission for the Balkans. Also joining us is Kavya Perlman. You all know her <laughs> as the visionary beyond, the visionary for today's metaverse, this week's rather, Metaverse Safety Week, also known affectionately as the Cyber Guardian, the founder and CEO of the XR Safety Initiative. Now, moderating this esteemed panel is Janie McFall, our Diversity and Inclusion Advisor in X size cyber xr coalition janie known professionally as janie laney is a friendly family gaming content creator and a podcaster she created an initiative called black minecraft in 2018 that focuses on the need for diversified representation in the gaming space specifically within the minecraft creator and gaming communities janie is also an xbox mvp that the gaming industry has recognized for her influence in the gaming industry. So, with no further ado, let's welcome our featured panelist, Jamie. Take it away. Hi, hello. Hey. Hey. Hi. Um, so, welcome everyone. We have curated some questions, and I hope you guys do enjoy the panel. So, First, this is for both of the panelists. Why are human rights important in the metaverse? Oh, Sarah, you want to take that to begin with? <laughs> sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for, um, firstly, just thank you so much to all the hosts for letting me join this discussion. Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, thanks to Janie for moderating us. Um, so my other colleagues have spoken about how important digital transformation and digital service delivery is you know, globally, um, you know, I work for the United Nations, so my constituency, if you like, is really developing countries. And I really think from a global perspective, rather than, than more US or, 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 or one, one country perspective. And my colleagues have really eloquently sort of outlined how critical um, digital is in the development landscape. Uh, so I don't want to repeat what they said, but I was so fascinated by what uh, Professor Rosenberg said at the beginning of today when he talked about, you know, the potential of the metaverse, because, you know, I'm not an expert on the metaverse. I think I'm here more from my human rights expertise. But we think about how we are utilizing, you know, digital tools, digital systems, digital service delivery for just everyday things at the moment. It already feels as though it, it touches every part of our lives. But the vision that Professor Rosenberg put forward of what the metaverse might look like, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years was, was so um, interesting. I, I found it really interesting because, of course, you know, it does unlock so many of these positive possibilities of engagement. Um, 
so many opportunities for enhanced communications, opportunities for people to have greater capabilities and how they interact with each other. And, you know, the, the development dividends of that and the human rights dividends of that are, are really so, so, uh, so broad and so deep. But it was also the other side of it that he pointed to, you know, so many of the concerns, so many of the of the um, human rights concerns that really are resonant of many human rights concerns we have about digital technologies currently, but because the metaverse itself has the potential to, to far more deeply impact um, people and how their data is used and how their data is accessed and privacy and surveillance and you know so many other issues that he pointed to. Why um, we really need to put human rights front and center in this conversation about safety in the metaverse, because the concerns we have right now um, about human rights risks and how to manage them and a human rights based approach for digital transformation would be amplified, I think, you know, by quite a quite a high margin in the type of interaction that he described at the beginning of today on lots of different fronts um, from privacy and surveillance in relation to bias and discrimination uh, the digital divide that my colleague sam you know really managed to i think explain so well uh, and so many other spaces so it's um it's an ampl it's amplification of the human rights concerns we currently have if that makes sense so i, I would start uh, with that comment jenny yeah yeah, Sarah, yeah. and uh, yeah, no, I just want to second that and kind of zoom in further. Is uh, at XRSI, we have been doing some research to potentially safeguarding metaverse. And if you look up safeguarding the metaverse, Kavya Perlman, it is research by um, myself, my colleagues, Mark Maniano, uh, and our medical XR advisor, Ryan Cameron, as well as uh, another. Uh, respected colleague, uh, Sam, uh, from MITRE Corporation, Sam's last name. Uh, but yeah, that research, the whole research started from uh, my experience back in 2017-18, being the head of security at Linden Lab. At least that's where the thoughts are. Like, how are we going we figured out how to segment these things in different categories. So back at Indian, I was thinking, what are we actually doing in this virtual world? Oh, okay, we are creating objects, pieces of objects, we are creating experiences, etc. Got it. We are connecting with people in a much more intimate way. So okay. And then we are also conducting commerce. So those were three very key aspects that got highlighted to me and I started to kind of work around that. And then as the whole thing stayed with me, we started to continue this research. So what I wanna zoom into this every aspect of creation, connection and commerce, every place, human rights should remain at the center of it. Because imagine that digital divide aspect, you know, not having the opportunity even to take part into these economies that are that are going to benefit so many people but we just can't take part because we don't have the creation tools we don't have the access to the infrastructure or all these other disadvantages that lots of the people as sam from the UNDP pointed out and of course sarah just reiterated a lot of these points and highlighted that that's what's really 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 important and then, of course, the economical aspect. People are going to be at disadvantage. This uh, digital divide will be amplified. So all in all, I would say these aspects are going to be contextualized, especially when we talk about healthcare. Let's say we utilize metaverse to receive healthcare. There is so much more data that is now going to be available to developers or um, people who are using these platforms, so healthcare data. And now, at least in the United States, if the companies, the insurance companies have access to these data, then they could potentially deny you coverage. So being, you know, sort of private 
having your autonomy has taken a whole another meaning now because for that safeguarding, like that's where the crux of it, we need to safeguard the human in the loop because that's what is so unique. Previously, you know, we were only worried about, oh, risk for privacy, et cetera. Now we have to care about the risk for autonomy. So human in the loop. And then back in 2016, I saw firsthand when you ignore the risks of what is the impact on society, kind of what we saw with Cambridge Analytica, and you can potentially even influence democracies. And that's what is so unique with the metaverse is we have a human in the loop. We absolutely need to prioritize human rights. We also have societies. The broader impact on societies is going to be too profound to ignore. Um, already we have several countries through climate change looking to the metaverse. We have a war ongoing on the other side of the planet, Europe, in Europe. And uh, how are we going to rebuild some of those historical things? We're going to have to utilize the metaverse to, uh, to re preserve some of that history. So that's why human rights are just so remarkably important at this juncture. That's why I feel so compelled and called to create this moment of reflection. Katie, I'm dying to know what are your thoughts as well on this? Why do you think it's important? I think it's important because it gives us a chance to actually do things right this time. Um, in our physical world, there have been several times where it's all about who has the amount of money, who's seen as like the, the hierarchy. But when we look at the metaverse right now, we have to look at what we can do. We, could, we have to look at the frameworks we can build and extend on so that our virtual world isn't as deadly as our physical world. And our virtual world standings can actually help to influence a great deal of our physical world. Just looking at it from how everyone all of a sudden start jumping on things like bitcoin and all you know all the virtual currencies these the virtual aspect of things is not fake it is really not fake and it has a giant influence of how we actually deal with each other for world for real world implications and sometimes i don't even like to use the term real world because the internet the metaverse, gaming, all of this technology is real. It really is real. And I think when people fail to ignore that this is still a form of reality, I think that's how we will end up losing if we don't take a look now, see things that we can extend upon, actually talk with each other from country to country, help to understand each other's cultures. I think that if we negate to do that, that we're just going to be just as bad in the virtual, which will make physical 10,000 times worse. So, yeah, like I, I think that our human rights actually taking a look into it, talking with each other is going to build for a better tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I'm the moderator. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I forgot for a second. Um, <laughs> Uh, currently, how do you both feel about the current state of human rights in the metaverse? I honestly don't think that we even understand, like we're scratching the surface together. I don't know, Sarah, how, how are you feeling about this current state? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In, I think there's so many dimensions of what's to come that are still to some extent you know being discovered so obviously there's an element of work in progress but I think that um, sometimes we can uh, go, in, go down the wrong path a little bit in this conversation uh, by trying to imagine or trying to think that there's going to be new human rights that are, are relevant in the metaverse are more relevant than the human rights we all enjoy right now and I think that that's sometimes can I think that's something that really needs to be debunked in this whole discussion um, I mean we're sitting here today 
and it's wonderful that this conversation is happening today because this is International Human Rights Day, which I think everybody probably knows, and that's such an important day for the global community because it celebrates you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was signed 74 years ago today. And that was a real global effort from countries all around the world after World War II to, to put together their, their vision of human dignity includes you know so many of the rights that have been talked about all day today you know the right to privacy uh, the need to for freedom of expression and association equality and um, non-discrimination all you know all these things have been talked about in different ways today and um, what is happening what's happened since then of course is that we're not working off of that same that 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 working only off of that one document you know there's there's a human rights system which is which has been established by by governments which has helped to explain what that document means it's been it's been further expanded upon by human rights treaties and some of them were written decades ago as well well before we had digital spaces even as we use them today and well before the the notion of the metaverse was really a, a realistic one um, but what's happening is that these rights are being unpacked in the context of the discussions about how we function as societies and how we um how we interact so the the human rights system provides a lot of guidance on what does the right to privacy look like when we're dealing with surveillance technologies what what is um, what is the freedom? What does freedom of association mean for human rights defenders or for civil society or for people um, in an online space? And um, I think we're going to have a challenge keeping up with technological um, developments because things are, are are you know this is such a, a robust and fast moving space. But I don't think that the rights themselves are, are going to change. How we understand them, how we interpret them, how we utilize them in the face of, of current technologies in the metaverse will have to be more better understood. And of course, these rights need to be respected. And this is this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, but the the rights that we're talking about um, are the same as those rights that were included in the Universal Declaration 74 years ago today. So I think that this notion that there's sort of digital rights is something we have to be a bit cautious of. We really need to be considering that rights are things that apply offline and they apply online, but how we realize them in an online space can be really quite different and has lots of challenges, but um, we need to work together as a global community to unpack how to do that effectively. You know, I really find that so insightful for our further, you know, developing a deeper understanding and how to approach this. Because thus far, um, I've been kind of running with this idea that, oh, okay, we, we need to, we need to kind of need new rights or we need to kind of make this digital rights or something. But that, you know, that, that flips my entire <laughs> understanding to now think, you know, build upon or contextualize the existing rights. And within that, Sarah, the one thing that I think, you know, I'd take the opportunity to, to ask you, um, would you please help me that understand what do we do with like the neuro rights type of phenomena? Um, where do we fit this sort of, you know, this is so much more intimate with biometrics, our human autonomy, human agency, et cetera. And I, I, I struggle <laughs> to contextualize that. And that's why, you know, sort of aspects of like neural rights or something. So how would we, how would we kind of do that if you could you know, provide some guidance? Because it's deeply insightful to understand, like we need to just contextualize better. Well, firstly, I think that there's a lot of information that's already out there. I do wonder how much we're all utilizing it. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming uh, because there is so much out there. But, you know, the Human Rights Council, which is the leading body within the United Nations that sets human rights policies and provides direction on human rights, it 
insightful presentations and reports. And, and I, you know, guidance essentially for how to go about this. So, you know, they have thematic experts called special rapporteurs on different human rights, and they have one on privacy, for instance. And, and she, you know, she works with me, these types of posts, what they do is they work with um, governments, they work with stakeholders, they work with companies, they work, you know, they take a whole of society approach and they try to pull out, you know, good examples of how things are done, how these human rights are being implemented in reality. And of course, they point to bad examples and they give recommendations. So, you know, she just issued the current special rapporteur is, is um, just issued a super interesting report on um, on a lot of issues we were talked about today about different legal approaches on how people are using personal data. You know, looking at how different legal systems approach this and which of those approaches are in line with the right to privacy and which aren't, you know. There's lots of guidance on biometrics um, and, you know, so there's a lot out there that's linked to human rights principles. Sometimes I wonder how much we're using some of, some of this uh, great guidance and, maybe there can be ways in which the community of people you know engaged today and in, in, in other spaces can um, make sure that they're utilizing some of this great uh, great support but in any case i think the other point you're making is you know when we're in such a fast evolving environment how do you maintain the focus on human dignity on autonomy on empowerment uh, because, of course, we can't wait for reports to come out from thematic experts a few times a year. And it's really by using a human rights based approach, which is looking at these principles of ensuring what we're doing is non discriminatory. that uh, um, We are uh, working on supporting capacities of people, of users um, and accountability, which is something that's been talked about a bit less today. Um, because the difference between a human rights based approach and talking about something like ethics is that human rights are based on legal responsibilities of states and increasingly of companies. And it's about having that relationship between people affected, whose human rights are affected, and people who are responsible for respecting these human rights. And, and how do you strengthen that relationship? And I think if you're using those principles, and as we go about, you know, the next 15 years, and there will be such rapid development, as, as Professor Rosenberg pointed out, and we'll be on the right road. Um, the challenge is just so much happening in this space, and how do you keep up it, I think. But principles of our principles are those human rights principles, and we're working towards the standards, you know, which are privacy and freedom of expression. And, you know, I think that we'll be on the right road. And that's, in my opinion, that's one of the importance about these conversations is that a lot of people, they do come from various arenas of just the principles. They understand the fundamentals. So if we are able to provide more access, provide the know-how for these individuals to enter the metaverse, then I think that it'll be so much easier for us to um, to expound on human rights. Uh, for instance, Sarah doesn't spend all day in VR, but that doesn't mean that Sarah doesn't know about human rights that should be within the metaverse because Sarah is an expert on human rights. So I, I think it's important for us to understand as these emerging technologies come about that we can't count out the principle. We cannot count out the fundamentals. Not everything has to be brand new. You know, if you don't know the fundamentals, how are you actually going to put those fundamentals into a new space? So I think Sarah was right in the thought process that, you know, are we actually using the materials that we already have? Are we using the resources that we already have? Or are we just guessing and basing everything off of our experience? Um, I'm really excited about uh, this talk in particular because it's something that I wasn't sure if it was important or not, 
uh, whenever people talk about human rights now, everything always seems like it's at a bias. It's only talking about one group, but the metaverse is very vast. And if we look at all of our human rights that have been drafted in these documents, then we can prepare to expound on those and to emphasize those for the extension of the metaverse. Um, for the next question, and this one, I, I, I want you to, to really think about it. What are your main concerns about the metaverse when it comes to human rights? So what are the top concerns that you both have? Well, Dave, we've been discussing you know, so many concerns. Um, maybe I'll just throw a couple of points to begin with. Is one of my major concerns is loss of autonomy. Is uh, it's kind of like you know, living in a new reality, which we think is real, but it's not. And it seems like we're talking about some kind of matrix, but that's that's the closest example I can provide. Is uh, making choices, but not even realizing that those choices are not mine. Um, potentially buying things like okay, I, I go back to 2007. 2007, I moved to the United States from India. Back in India, I you know was very like not so pro technology. I, I I did my bachelor's in computer application, but I wasn't using lots of technology or consumer goods, etc. But then I decided to change my career to becoming a hairstylist. Then like. I think I woke up almost after like five years. It's like clothes that I didn't need. I had come to America and I just sort of become this sort of consumerism, part of this consumerism. And a few years later, suddenly it just occurred to me and like, wait, why is all this here? Like it, it, was, it was like as if I was like sleepwalking kind of crazy moment. And then I just completely changed my life. You know, of course, I changed my religion and, you know, I studied did my master's and all that. But at the same time, I realized, how does the Indian woman who didn't ever want to touch a product on her hair went from that to like everything, all the products, all kinds of fashions and all kinds of these things, accessory is because I was targeted. Now, my fear is that we will be targeted to make choices that may not even be ours. And we may not even realize that. And that's the challenge, is we might completely lose our autonomy. And this would, why I say that? Because I see on the horizon in computer interfaces intersection. When you allow a input-output interface to human brain, which by the way, Elon Musk is saying six months human trial, so, okay, input audit interface to the human brain, but then the access to that data is given to the developers sitting in the Silicon Valley and people who literally want to utilize and manipulate you to sell products and do their own thing by Tesla, apparently. <laughs> so how, how can I possibly believe that? You know, so that is top of my mind concern that we need United Nations to step in and kind of draw this red line there and say, hey, you will not touch human agents and autonomy. Otherwise, we're just walking robots and just like making choices so this consumerism machine could feed itself and a bunch of these billionaires could get richer and richer. And that's top of my concern, Janie. Sarah? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think I don't want to repeat what other what others have said. Um, but it's hard when you know right now that only 19% of women in the least developed countries have access to the internet, one in five. It's hard to, to, to uh, not be extremely worried about, about creating a two-speed world, about creating you know, really divided societies. Um, and I think the point you were making about bias and discrimination it is a really big topic of discussion in this space, but it's really, it's a topic that needs, 
it that needs that attention because you have you know a couple of countries and I'm, I'm sitting in the US right now so I'll mention it which um, have a disproportionate influence because of the industry that's created here and and the great innovation that has been you know has has, has uh, supported that um, have you know a very limited perspective creating platforms and tools that uh, even with the best of intentions it's very hard to understand how you could avoid some implicit bias um, when these these platforms are exported around the world. But my biggest concern is similar to Kaiva's, which is um, around issues of privacy. And the right to privacy is very important in, in every situation that you're in. It should be your decision. You want to share about yourself and your family, and this I think we would all agree with that. But in the digital space, it is such an enabler for so many other human rights. Um, one of the papers that I mentioned earlier uh, that was written by one of these thematic experts of the Human Rights Council described it really well because they said that it's a gateway for other rights in the digital space. If you don't have privacy, if you don't have the sense of trust, you're able to engage in a way that's going to respect your privacy. Are you going to exercise your freedom of expression? Are you going to engage online? Are you, you know, perhaps you, you might without realizing the implications of it, but I think in the digital space, privacy has an even greater importance. Um, and, and, you know, the answer to these questions is really by having this very deserted approach to looking at impacts in the design phase and, and not waiting till that's after the fact. Of course, I think it's one of the other speakers talked about that earlier. Uh, and having these clear standards and, and you know, there's still so many differing approaches to that, and that's that is the challenge. And we've talked about it very, very, very briefly, but with the fundamental of human rights framework already being established, what are the possible consequences of big tech companies still trying to take over the metaverse? Sarah, you you have some thoughts on the corporate side of things going yeah. awry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, governments are the parties that by and large, you know, responsible for upholding human rights in, in their countries and uh, but the business sector increasingly, like in the last 10 years in particular, has been really um that whole discussion has really escalated in the united nations there's a, a set of guiding principles they were they were adopted in 2011 and they're on business and human rights and they they really point to the fact that businesses need to respect human rights in their business operations and that means the impact of their work it means um how they go about their business um how they you know how they how they are as corporate citizens, let's say. Um, and uh, that's created a real impetus around this discussion around business and human rights, because you know, I would argue, and many others would as well, that businesses respect that respect human rights are it's also good for business to do that. You know, you're enabling consumers, you're making an economic case. And there's a lot of, of research around that. So there is a, a growing recognition in the, in the United Nations that businesses also have responsibilities. It's not just governments and businesses' responsibilities are to respect human rights and what they do. So not, of course, more broadly as governments do in terms of everything that's going on, but that businesses really have this responsibility. And a lot of companies are, are, are trying to find ways to do this. And some of them are doing a really good job. And um, it's a very sort of dynamic discussion, actually. It's quite an exciting one. Um, but in this particular discussion around the metaverse and, 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 and legal frameworks, it becomes really challenging because what's happening is that um, the approaches that companies take are taking are outpacing legislative developments in countries. So if you're in country X and you're accessing a digital product that not necessarily made a digital product you know as a that's available globally you know some countries have legal frameworks that might you know in place 
um, ways in which to do so, and there's some extreme examples of that, of course. But many countries are still developing their legal frameworks. So it is the case, I think you phrased the question really well, Jenny, that as countries are doing that, you know, companies are already moving ahead, and that's the current situation. So there has to be a lot of attention paid to that in the context of the development of the technologies for the metaverse, because there is there are different uh, tracks, let's say, and different speeds that are happening in different countries. Yeah, yeah, Sarah. It reminds me of you know fairly recently, um, I I was part of uh, this peace, security, and defense summit. And that's where um, in the morning we organized a round table and the topic really, you know, and that peace, security and defense summit brought together several of the, the key players where we were talking about NATO uh, participants, you know, Minister of Finland, Defense Minister of Finland, Defense Minister of Belgium and several other countries. And on that morning, we had this round table with like IBM, Intel, Vodafone and several other key players in Europe that he basically talked about how their role is so important in societal resilience. And I think when we talk about societal resilience, like making a society that is resilient to harm. And what is that harm? Society is made of human beings. And so th I think that's what it reminds me of is um, oftentimes we feel like you know, governments are the answer, but we have, by, by whatever virtue of this technology, now we have these big tech companies that are practically uh, taking a very large role in influencing how our societies are growing, how our societies are operating, how they are even developing and shaping further. I mean, if a particular billionaire with a single tweet can sway the opinion of several people, you know, then we are, we, we're at a different intersection here. And the reason why we got to look at it kind of, it's not a danger or sounding alarm. It's just acknowledging the fact that we have to have all those entities at the table as well. And that's why like today, I'm kind of really, really grateful that our headliners, Meta, and a lot of their policy team is listening to every word that comes out and will be pushing for it. And then we want, I want to, I want to know where is the rest of the world? Where are the rest of the or corporations? And I really would love to invite them into this conversation to reflect on this. I mean, I want to know where is the, you know, where are the big players? Where's Apple? You know, where, why aren't we having this conversation with you guys? And let's have closed door conversation if you don't want to take position. It's really, really important that we acknowledge it's not just government, uh, human rights, must be a responsibility for corporates too. And then we really should compel and ask and request kindly to the United Nations like agencies to hold them accountable. Because you know, uh, there, there has been genocide led by technology pretty much. And we haven't had that accountability till now. So this is, this is, this could get worse. And that's why I'm like, you know, I think uh, we should look at um, corporations as the key player in these metaverse new society and then ask them to participate ask them to participate in metaverse safety week or other conversations so yeah that's what it reminds me of that very moment where we were sitting around and acknowledging that, just that very fact wow that was oh that was good <laughs> um wow okay uh, this kind of segues us to uh, to another question, which is, how has the relationship between government, and I'm also going to add big tech companies, digital advocates and activists strengthened over the last few years about human rights in the metaverse, if it's strengthened at all? I don't know. Uh, so at least, you know, the recent trip that I mentioned to Europe, I was also in Dubai. I mean, these are the very core concerns. I have the same mission to help build safety and inclusion in these emerging tech ecosystem. So wherever I go, that's kind of voice that carries together with me. When I talk to, you know, advocates, well, I want to know where are the rest of the advocates 
and we need to at least allocate tiny 0.1% of the energy of your advocacy to these emerging tech ecosystem. I was in a room where a lot of these multilateralism discussions were going on, and in the end I said, we are still solving the problems of 2020, 2016. We're solving the problems of social media. That has already kind of impacted everything that it, it, it possibly can, and it's going to get worse with the metaverse. And that's why I really encouraged, that, you know, hey, we need to think about what's emerging because yes we need to solve the problems of the past but we can't dismiss the metaverse i remember i was at a twitter space some of these um and not to kind of bash anybody i really really respect all the work that everybody's doing but you know some of the um, facebook files disclosure etc they were being discussed wildly with the journalists but then when i said hey what about the metaverse or the convergence of these technologies they all just laughed at me and it was just kind of funny that, you know, when I'm jumping into these realities, I know all of my data, all of my biometrics is potentially going to, inevitably going to be recorded. I would be profiled. More and more sophisticated this technology gets, that's going to happen. So my question is, we can laugh about it today, or we could just confront it and acknowledge that yes, this is happening. And if I say something against and very anti, well, thank God I live in the United States, but think about another country. I was, you know, also in Saudi Arabia and literally was cautioned to not go into politics even when there is no device around. Uh, because it's it's just that simple. You will potentially be could be at risk of getting murdered getting silenced getting deplatformed for even having an opinion i want to also mention janie this was something so remarkable and i would never forget this in my life this is happening right now with the ukrainian people and they're suffering through you know a war and they are feeling the emotions of a war some of the you know their poets are writing poetry about how russian you know, atrocities are impacting them. But the moment they put that out there in a user-generated content, their account is banned, they're deleted, they're not allowed to even talk anymore. So in a user-generated context, all of this history is literally being deleted because somebody set the, you know, somebody set the rules and they will continue to set the rules according to their own accord. And I'm now I'm sitting here thinking, how can we not even have a right to express ourselves when we are feeling tremendous grief for the loss of all of our loved ones, anyone that's alive? And that is so concerning to me, is this tremendous power that uh, you know, corporates would have. And that's why I'm like, I really encourage everyone, activists, people to like, hey, we got to pay attention to these emerging tech. Yes, we got to solve the previous problem, but this, this is too important. Otherwise, people like me, we I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have this platform. It's simple. I wouldn't be allowed. Uh, and especially, I couldn't be allowed if I was in a different country. You know, imagine moving from being a Hindu to becoming a Jewish person and then assuming an Islamic religion. Only in the United States of America, you can stand on this platform in virtual reality and do what I do. I highly doubt it's possible in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Janie, this is too personal to me, but thank you. It is. Sarah, any thoughts? Oh, thanks. I mean, I think that there's a very mixed picture. Um, unfortunately, there's some really concerning global trends that we're seeing. Um, Civicus Monitor, which is a, a, a platform of civil society organizations, um, who pull and consolidate data and monitor sort of the health of our civic space and societies and countries. So, you know, how easy is it to participate in the glow in the in the public square? You know, they have, you know, issued data which shows a really, you know, a continually concerning downward trend about the sort of health of that engagement globally, you know, with only, I think it's less than 15% of countries that they monitor. Um, being considered to be truly open and growingly open in terms of civic engagement and 
you know, then you have to unpack that number of courses of what it means. And that's, of course, just one source. But International IDEA, which is a really reputable research organization supporting, you know, lots of different um, global trends analysis, found that over the COVID-19 pandemic, over 60% of countries saw a decline in their human rights protection. This isn't, of course, just about the digital space, but as I was saying earlier, uh, the same human rights that apply offline apply online. So, you know, these trends, how, how, I haven't seen data in terms of how that unpacks itself in the digital space, but I imagine it would be quite similar, um, if not having some very specific particularities. Another really concerning trend is that um, there are growing reprisals, which is, I think, what you were talking about, Kaiva, um, against people who are trying to um, you, you know, have freedom of expression in, in, in certain spaces. And this is actually an offline and an online trend. And there's some internal organizations that, that publish annual data on that that you can see. So the online world is reflecting some of the trends we're seeing in the offline world. And this is another reason why I think we need to be careful about being too particular about how human rights are different in the online space. They might manifest themselves differently, but the rights themselves are are the same. Um, so, you know, that's a really, those are all really, really concerning appro approaches, which is, and some of that, of course, you know, the pandemic created a lot of closed spaces and that, of course, has to be borne in mind when we're looking at that data globally. But the sorts of things that my colleague Sam was talking about earlier about whole society approaches is what's really important there. And that's very central to human rights um, because you're talking about empowering people, the rights holders themselves. So the people who are using the platforms and making the design of these things people-centered effectively. And how to do that effectively, you know, you need to build relationships with you know, certainly the business community that's designing these platforms, but also the governments that are putting in place regulations to enforce them. And, Somebody mentioned at the beginning that this event is in some association with the Australian National Human Rights Commission, which you know, has been doing fantastic work on monitoring uh, digital rights for uh, rights in the digital space for people with disabilities, for instance, and how they can use digital services better. And they're, you know, they provided an initial report and now they're supporting. I don't want to speak for them because maybe one of them is here and can clarify, but my understanding is that they're now, you know, supporting monitoring to see how that's improving for people with disabilities in Australia and how they're able to improve um, access to digital services, which is really critical now in the sort of digital banking world we live in. So there's a lot of different actors that can be a part of the solution, but we do need to take this whole of society approach. I think just sort of narrowing it down doesn't help and having an overarching framework of, of non-discrimination and accountability is very important um, rather than it being sort of a moral choice that you know I want to do the right thing here and I want you know I want my rules to follow X and um, that's fine too of course but human rights is not um, it's not something that you can kind of opt into or opt out of and I think it brings a different a different dimension to the discussion. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Sarah, you mentioned uh, <laughs> uh, Australia's Human Rights Commission. Uh, Lorraine Finlay is actually our closest note address. Um, so that really, I'm like, wow, I, we should totally <laughs> keep our ears open for every word that Lorraine is going to share with us. And for our final question, um, is it important for governments to be transparent about the use of XR technologies, why or why not? Oh my it's, gosh. it's absolutely fundamental that they're transparent about the technologies they're using. And people need to understand how they're engaging and what they're engaging with. And it's about trust in societies and that is the trust in institutions, trust in societies, trust in how you're engaging as a society as people move more and more into engagement in digital spaces. If you don't have that trust in, in the space that you're using, um, if you're concerned that your data might be being sold against your will or you know whatever, whatever may or, or may not be happening, it would absolutely undermine not just the utility of that space, but the trust 
between you know societies and within societies and that's fundamental for resilience as you were saying kaiva um and uh you know societal harmony and progression and, and lots of different things and as we move more and more into digital being part of our public discourse which it already is of course but even more into that in, in relation to the metaverse it'll become even more important uh, transparency in my view is really fundamental i completely completely agree and can you imagine um you know right now we're kind of talking about these things but more and more so I mean, I saw that firsthand in 2016, back when I was working at Facebook as a party security advisor, 5,000 data points were potentially used by Cambridge Analytica to influence people's behavior. Each American, you know, they, they use 5,000 data points. And the virtual reality, you can have over 2 million unique body recordings in 20, 20 minutes. So those type of data points, imagine now government using that to potentially persuade you in ways that are not transparent. And then, you know, then we, we, we would practically lose trust in democracy in any of these systems that work for us. So yeah, I, I, I would love to, and, you know, ask audience, uh, you know, what questions, this must bring up a lot of questions on top of their minds too, but JD, but yeah, we need trust. Trust is a key, as Sarah said. Yes, and I do believe that we are in the Q&A part, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. All right, so feel free to walk up to the mics if you guys have any questions for our panelists. You just have to click and raise. Oh, I thought that they had to walk down the thing or click and raise. If you could click and raise, you should be able to mic you up quickly. There's a hand, raise hand, click on your right hand side. April, what are, what are your questions as you hear this whole topic as we wait for potential from the audience. Well, with me, with um, thinking about the, uh, the aspects of it, it's always the finding the fine line between the sense of urgency, right? Um, with making sure that we have um, the right people in the room to help move us forward. That is always first and foremost in our mind, which is essentially why the XRSI, in addition to the CyberX Coalition, were created. I can hear you better now. And since you are all unmuted, you're able to unmute yourself, you're welcome to come closer to the stage and ask your question to you. Danny, do you see any online questions? Um, oh. And then Sarah, I think we should definitely know that, you know, how do we, how do people engage? Because, you know, I know you Sam and other colleagues of yours, how do we have these prioritized deeper conversations? across the governments like what, what do you think is the best track forward with so many competing priorities i'd love to hear from you as well i mean that's a great question obviously it varies a lot depending on your context and where you're sitting and um you know um you know there's there's public consultations on laws and countries that work in diff differently than other countries so it really depends on on where you're where you're sitting obviously civic activism you know what we're doing right now bringing together stakeholders to discuss and and try to grow knowledge and consensus on these issues to go out to go back into our regular lives after conferences like this are over and try to influence and bring to bear 
um, these perspectives and our and how we're working and who we're working with and highlighting these issues is very important but each country of course will have different ways of engagement they develop their legal frameworks and you know and then obviously also businesses increasingly um you know are are consulting one thing that we're seeing out of the business and human rights movement that i mentioned is an increased use of human rights impact assessments by businesses and due diligence processes these are the two sort of major recommendations out of that movement on business and human rights so a lot of companies including some tech companies um are starting to do this and that includes you know consultation with end users you know in the design stage and you know throughout use and 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 in terms of how these things are being applied and you know so there's lots of different um i don't want to present it that is happening in every that every company is doing this because that's not the case but um there is a growing movement and it's quite a, an exciting one and there's a lot of tech engagement in it around the business and human rights space and it does include utilizing a lot of these tools which should be spaces for a consultation and listening and, and, and activism as well to, to talk about what these technologies mean for people's lives. Okay. Late and you probably covered some of the stuff I'm going to ask you, and that guy that covered some of it. Well, some, how do you expect? Uh, I, I presume you're on about social platforms or where people are going to meet. How do you expect to uh, uh, police these things? Do you, are you expecting more moderation? Um, in a lot of the platforms that you see in the social platforms, there's almost practically no moderation at all. Uh, how, how, how would you actually police uh, a policy if you get people to agree to a framework? Do you expect them to employ more uh, moderators and, and actively check things out? I just wonder how you're approaching that. It's really, really awesome question. Um, Sarah, I mean, we, we've been working on a XRSI privacy and safety framework to provide very, very granular guidance. Um, and um, so I, I really am keen to hear your thoughts, but just quickly, uh, Andy, um, this is practically <laughs> our mission, is to reflect, not just reflect, but really dive deep into research aspects of these technologies. How are we to utilize very technologies that are kind of converging and evolving, uh, such as artificial intelligence, for example? Mm. Well, one example could be, and, and that's where, you know, human rights and the line, that red line that I'm talking about, it really highlighted, is uh, uh, utilizing artificial intelligence scale moderation. Okay, well said, but uh, then comes the human biases. All those human biases are already baked into these AI algorithms where people of color are at disadvantage, they are misunderstood. Somebody, poet said, oh, hate, hatred towards somebody in Russia, and then outright ban. So AI is not so sophisticated, at least just yet, but like utilizing the very technologies to potentially scale moderation, that is one potential answer. However, because we can't, especially in the metaverse, we can't catch everybody's mouth who says it. And it's impossible, just like in real life. So then what do we do? We have to look at you know, mitigating harm. How do we mitigate harm? One, we can build a better foundation for the future. Two, we can build better tools, such as like safety bubble, especially very use useful for women. You know, because you can't undo that harm when somebody makes a groping gesture at you, when somebody surrounds you and you're feeling very overwhelmed because it feels very real lifelike. So utilizing your technology to potentially mitigate harm, but also having that red line, allowing we need guidance from agencies like the UN. You know, where is this red line where we don't just set up a surveillance state in the name of safety? And create like what it what is called as panopticon, a prison effect where every prisoner is watched in the name of hey, we want to safeguard you so that our AI watch every of your move so they could capture him up and the end or something. Yeah, that's that's to me it's it's an open question. We're working on a framework, but I look to Sarah for any insights there too. Um, my thought is precision regulation frameworks like XRSI privacy. 
Yes, and I think we'll yeah. leave the last comment to Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah, in our last minute. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the United Nations puts into um, you know, resolutions and laws the will of member states. Um, the member states come together and came together 74 years ago to outline the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then it was put into this legal framework by the mechanism of the United Nations. But what the United Nations produces in terms of its laws and guidance is based on the multilateral system and it's based on member states and discussions and votes and you know all those machinations. Um, so I think that's also a really important thing to point out because when member states come together like they did a couple of years ago at the General Assembly and issued a new resolution on the right to privacy and included things in that about how critical it was for freedom of expression and how to balance it. That's the will of member states. And then the question for us is, well, how do we then support those governments to make that a reality? And, you know, similarly to the business sector. So, I mean, I think we we're talking about a specific scenario in relation to content moderation. And um, the guidance from the United Nations is... Uh, is to avoid censorship where it's all possible, but the, there's a recognition that you have to balance uh, the harms that could be done against you know, principles of legality and proportionality and so on and so forth. And that that has to be, manif you know, the guidance says that should be manifested in these policy moderation um, you know, policies that are enacted by companies and organizations. So the United Nations can help unpack what that really means, but then how that happens and is, is then internalized by you know, governments and then the private sector and lots of other actors. So this is the last time I'm talking, so I just want to thank you all for having me and thank the moderator as well. Thank you so much, Janine. Yes, <clears throat> yes, ladies, thank you. Thank you for all of your amazing insights that were shared here with us today. Yes, accolades, emojis, yes. <laughs> we are going to take a five minute break. We will be right back.